Hello. Uh, welcome to the first of uh, what will be several lectures on the cognitive neuroscience of memory. Uh, in particular, we're going to be focusing on mostly longer term forms of memory, but I will be talking about working memory and executive attention and other types of memory as well along the way. Uh, in this first lecture, I'm going to do a historical introduction to uh, the neuroscience of memory because there are a number of important historical events that really lead up to the way in which we conceptualize and think about memory and particularly the neuroscience of memory. And also, I just think it's an important story to tell. Um, and so that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with Carl Lashley and uh, his student, um, whose name is escaping me at the moment. <laughs> Um, Donald Hebb, sorry. So Carl Lashley and his student Donald Hebb, very important figures in uh, thinking about uh, the cellular basis of memory and the location of uh, parts of the brain where memory might be, might be conducted or stored or uh, etc. And then the other uh, major historical figure we'll talk about is patient H.M. or Henry Mollison, uh, whose story is of particular importance uh, in this case. So... Uh, this is Carl Ashley. Carl Ashley was very interested in um, trying to determine where memories were stored or what he called the engram. Uh, the engram is essentially the idea is that there is a location or a code or something. Where is that memory engram stored? So sort of think about a biological locus for memory. Uh, and uh, Carl Lee did a ton of research, well, actually did a ton of research uh, in this area using mostly rats. A lot of rats gave their lives to this particular cause. Um, and the way rat research in this era essentially worked, particularly for uh, the, pi excuse me, the pioneers, is they would teach the rat something, you know, locations through a maze, something along those lines. Um, uh, how to find their way through a maze, and then they would take the rat out of the maze, um, do a little bit of neurosurgery and ablate part of their brain. So they might damage a little part of the brain. Uh, and there are a variety of ways to do that. And then put the rat back in and see if it's still remembered. Essentially, they would give the rat a memory test after doing neurosurgery. Um, but uh, Lashley didn't have much luck. Um, he couldn't really locate any single location where memories were stored. And one of the things we sort of learned from Lashley's research is that memory storage is completely separate from memory encoding. And so that's gonna be an important part of this story. Now his student Donald Hebb uh, believed that uh, memory was based on connections between neurons. And in fact, this is the beginning of what we call Hebbian learning or uh, connectionist models of neural networks where neural network models basically learn by strengthening the connections between nodes in a network. We'll um, dive into that when we get into looking how, uh, at how knowledge is stored in the brain uh, a little further on <clears throat> in uh, this series. So that's Donald Hebb uh, and that Hebbian learning, again, very important. So here are some of their lasting contributions that are going to be a theme that will keep coming up uh, throughout our discussions about modern neuroscience research and memory. First of all is this question of localizing functions. Uh, this is something that Lashley is really one of the people who got us started down this route of trying to localize particular cognitive functions in the brain. And so really, you might think of Lashley as one of the earliest cognitive neuroscientists. The other um, issue that Lashley brought up or brought forward uh, into the sort of zeitgeist is this idea that there is some sort of critical area for memory, that there's some part of the brain that is critical for memory functioning. Now, uh, the other thing we get from Lashley, in particular Hebb, is this idea that connections between neurons are a potential mechanism for learning. And we're going to talk about the cellular basis of learning and memory through what we call long-term potentiation, as well as some other ways in which <clears throat> um, neurons themselves form uh, networks that create and store memories. So these are important uh, concepts that we're going to visit throughout the semester. That gets us to Henry Mollison, or H.M. For most of my career, we didn't know who H.M. was because he was still alive. H.M. Uh, died in the, mm, I should know uh, the specific date, around 2013, I think, somewhere in there. Um, so not all that long ago. He had uh, temporal lobe surgery in 1953. Um, so 
<clears throat> about 60 years of research. Oh, sorry. I have it right here. He died in 2008. So I was a little off in terms of age. He died at age 82. He had his um, temporal lobe surgery in 1953. He was born in 1926. So he was 27 when he had his surgery and uh, died in 2008. Um, what happened to HM is he actually had a severe form of epilepsy. And um, as a result, and I think, as I recall, part of the story is, is that he'd had a bicycle accident as a child um, that started this uh, form of epilepsy. Uh, so in the 1950s, we didn't know a lot about uh, the brain or how it functioned um, or what parts of the brain really did what. And so uh, he underwent a pretty radical bit of neurosurgery in which they removed significant portions of his medial temporal lobes and almost all of his left and right hippocampi. Um, and so you can see uh, patient HM's right temporal lobes, um, pretty significant loss of uh, tissue, a little bit less so in the left temporal lobes, but also pretty significant amounts of uh, loss. So if we look um, in uh, some brain scans from 1992 versus 2003. Uh, you can see pretty significant reductions in uh, brain matter volume from 1992 to 2003. It would have been 71 about this point. Um, and you can really see that there's pretty significant loss of the hippocampus. In fact, you can't even see really the hippocampus on one side <clears throat> versus the other. Um, so you can see here, uh, the hippocampus is, of course, located beneath the temporal lobes. It's connected uh, through the limbic system to the amygdala, which is part of the brain responsible for our emotional processing. <clears throat> and directly connected to the uh, hippocampus are the medial temporal lobe structures, and these are going to become very important. Now, what happened with patient, patient HM after this rather radical surgery is uh, he had severe anterior grade amnesia. And that severe to anterior grade amnesia essentially meant that he was no longer able to form new memories or new conscious forms of memory, which is really important. Um, and so this is where we start to learn that these, this, this is the part of the brain that's critical for memory. It's not that he, that was where memories were stored. This is where memories were created. And that's a really important step in understanding memory. We also um, learn uh, through some really clever um, experiments by Barbara Milner and colleagues uh, that HM could still learn. Uh, he could do mirror tracing. And we talked about this in a previous lecture about um, learning new motor skills. And in mirror tracing, uh, your hand is hidden and the only thing you can see is the reflection of the mirror. So you have to learn to trace things backwards. Um, so he was able to learn how to do that. He was able to improve on what's called the pursuit rotor task. And in the pursuit rotor task, what you do is you have to take that little metal wand and keep it on that disc in the middle as you chase it around the circle. There are uh, more modern versions of this where you um, trace around different uh, shapes and objects, etc. So it's not always the same kind of task. Um, he was able to learn what's called the Tower of London. Sometimes it's called the Tower of Hanoi. Um, there are actually uh, several apps you can <laughs> play this game. I don't find it particularly all that enthralling to do, but you can download it and do it, or you can find yourself one of these apparatuses. Essentially, the task is you have to move the discs from the first peg to the third peg. You have to move one disc at a time to another peg, and a larger disc can never be on top of a smaller disc. And so you have to go through a series of permutations of moving discs back and forth. And it, you can learn how to do it in a relatively quick fashion. So he was able to learn all of these things, but he had no conscious memory of ever having done so. And so he didn't remember doing them, but he was still learning. And so this is where we start to get the understanding that there are different types of memory. We have conscious memories, or what we call explicit memories, declarative memories or episodic memories, depending on who you want to ask. But essentially, these are memories that are linked to specific times and places where we have a feeling of remembering or a conscious awareness of that memory. But there's another type of memory which we don't remember. That is, we don't have conscious awareness of it. And that's a really important um, thing we learned as well from patient HM. 
So here's what patient HM, and uh, I still call him that even though it's Henry Mollison. Um, here's what he taught us about memory, or his case taught us about memory. First, that short-term memory and long-term memory are biologically distinct. Patient uh, Henry Mollison had perfectly intact uh, short-term and working memory. He was able to think and um, manipulate information. We also understand that some long-term memories are stored throughout the brain. Um, Henry could still remember a great deal of his childhood, a great deal of the um, events that occurred prior to his surgery. Uh, we also know that the hippocampus is necessary for the creation of new memories. And so this is a critical structure um, by which all of our experiences get processed into long-term uh, memories. We also know there's no more than one long-term type of memory. There are conscious forms of memory and uh, uh, implicit or, or unconscious or non-declarative forms of memory which are not tied to specific times and places. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the anatomy of learning and memory, quick introduction to that. And then after that lecture, I'm going to get into some specifics about amnesia and dementia. And one of the things we see in dementia is as we, the medial temporal lobe structures start to degrade, um, patients start to lose their ability to remember times and places, in particular places and faces and people. Um, but they get what we call topographic agnosia in that they can no longer recognize familiar places, and that's because of that degradation of those medial temporal lobe structures. Okay, well, that's a quick historical overview, a couple of really important um, historical figures that really set up the way we think about uh, longer-term forms of memory.